Stranger Things. We all love its 1980s nostalgia and for hunting out those Easter eggs that the Duffer brothers have hidden for us to find. Take the title of the first episode of season four, The Hellfire Club. In Stranger Things, it's a reference to a Dungeons and Dragons group headed by the metal-loving dungeon master, Eddie Munson. Though they took their name from 1980, and if you're a fan of Marvel Comics, you'll know exactly from where, the Hellfire Club name can trace its origins all the way back to 18th century England. Hellfire! Join me now as we delve into the dark side of this mysterious club and discover the path that it took to find itself in Stranger Things. A Hell of an Ancestry Before Stranger Things, if you're a fan of the X-Men comic book series, you'll be well aware of the Hellfire Club with its principal character of Sebastian Shaw. Shaw, along with the Hellfire Club, have been around since 1980 and issue 129 of the Uncanny X-Men. Shaw has even put in an appearance in the film franchise as nemesis to the X-Men in the 2011 film X-Men First Class. You're one of them? the role of Sebastian Shaw going to actor Kevin Bacon, which is a cue for us to start our own version of the game Six Degrees of Separation as we trace the origins of Hellfire. Though it's not explained in Stranger Things that the comic book series is the source of the title for their version of the Hellfire Club, several references made in the series to the X-Men character Dark Phoenix make it pretty obvious that this is likely the case. The show's creators, the Duffer Brothers, are clearly fans of the Uncanny X-Men with numerous references made to the series. For example, the character Duncan suggests that Eleven could be a mutant and calls his radio transmitters Cerebro after the device that the X-Men character Charles Xavier uses to psychically connect with the wider world. It's also been pointed out that there are strong parallels between the telekinetic powers of Stranger Things Eleven and X-Men's Jean Grey. Where Marvel's Uncanny X-Men takes its inspiration from is said to be a 1966 episode of a British TV spy series called The Avengers. Titled A Touch of Brimstone, the episode in question sees Avengers characters John Steed and Emma Peel take on a group calling itself the Hellfire Club. This group aren't mutants, however, they're simply naughty landed gentry looking to revive an earlier 18th century incarnation of the club with some pranks played on the establishment, as well as some good old-fashioned drinking, gambling and womanizing. The storyline of the episode was reasonably family-friendly TV territory, yet it found itself being banned in the US. The reason why also leads us to a possible key to the question of how an episode of The Avengers became the inspiration for an uncanny X-Men storyline. Mrs. Peel. The ban came about because of the outfit, both designed and worn by Diana Rigg, in the latter scenes of the episode. Dubbed the Queen of Sin costume, it featured knee-high leather boots, a tight-fitting black bodice, a snake, <clears throat> and was topped off with a spike collar. It certainly was a heart-skipping, jaw-dropping moment for television, made more so when the character was given a good whipping, forcing British TV execs to intervene and trim that scene down. So Stranger Things took its inspiration for Hellfire from the Uncanny X-Men, and in turn, X-Men took theirs from the Avengers. But where did the idea for the Avengers Hellfire Club come from? Well, that Hellfire Club is based at least in part on fact. It's always the frigging Freemasons. There are several incarnations of the Hellfire Club, like Six Degrees of Separation, one leading to the other throughout the 18th century. Following its lineage back, most would agree that it starts with largely honourable principles found in the English Freemasonry circles from which the club sprung. Society was becoming more materialistic, the church was in decline, a moral code was found wanting in the void, and from this appeared groups determined to point out to all that which was wrong in the land, using reason, philosophy, and all that the Age of Enlightenment seemed to promise. That was at least the idea, that Hellfire would symbolise a rebellion against faith, its young, wealthy, entitled members seeking out their own version of Rage Against the Machine. The at-times political activist and writer Daniel Defoe 
best known for his most famous novel, Robinson Crusoe, in which his main character often wrestles with the notion of God, wrote about such a club in his book titled A System of Magic, in which he describes being at a pagan circle near Old Charing, where God was owned, sworn by, imprecated, blasphemed and denied all in one breath. Though Defoe neglected to mention the name of the club that he visited, and though Hellfire was just one of a number of such clubs, the events that he describes give us an insight into what was brewing below the surface in many of the newly opened coffee houses to be found in this part of London. The youth were rebelling. It was through this hubble, bubble and trouble that the first incarnation of the Hellfire Club began its doors opening to members in 1719 before being promptly shut down in 1721. Though accounts of the club would suggest that it was primarily only interested in mocking religious rituals, with members partaking in meals of Holy Ghost pie, breast of Venus, or devil's loin, while drinking hellfire punch and dressed as characters from the Bible, it was enough for the conservative government of the time to introduce a parliamentary bill largely aimed against it and entitled An Act for the More Effectual Suppressing of Blasphemy and Profaneness. Tonight I'm going to party like it's 1749. The most infamous incarnation of the Hellfire Club is the one that was centred around Sir Francis Dashwood. This gathering was much more the party to excess and you're all going straight to hell type affair that you might expect from an affiliation with a name like Hellfire. Only problem is, it wasn't called the Hellfire Club, or at least not during its existence. Brotherhood of St. Francis of Wye, Orders of Knights of West Wickham, or the Order of the Friars of St. Francis of West Wickham were some of the names that it went by, but never Hellfire. For all intents and purposes though, it was a continuation of Hellfire, and to this day, when describing a Hellfire club, most would be picturing the type of scenes that you may have been witness to at this one. The reason why it's attached to the Hellfire name is because of its connection to Sir Francis Dashwood who had allegedly been a member of a Hellfire Club that met during the 1730s at a London Inn that still exists today, albeit now under the guise of being a restaurant, the wonderfully titled Georgian Vulture Inn. After that Hellfire ceased, Sir Francis formed a new club, meeting at the same Georgian Vulture. This club, formed in 1746, was called the Order of the Knights of St. Francis, named for himself, Sir Francis Dashwood, and attracted some rather notable characters. The painter William Hogarth, for one, who was well known at the time for his satirical paintings including the infamous A Rake's Progress. Another member would go on to become one of the founding fathers of the United States and signee of the Declaration of Independence, his name Benjamin Franklin. Where the more infamous Hellfire concept starts to enter the frame, however, is when the club moves to the caves of the West Wickham Hills outside London. This was around 1751, and here, in a series of tunnels that have been dug into the side of the Chalk Hill, it's been suggested that they were truly able to live up to the club's motto of Do What Thou Wilt. The tunnels were decorated with mythological themes, and located throughout were phallic and other symbols of a mock religious nature. The members addressed each other as brothers, the leader was known as the abbot, while female guests, a euphemism for prostitutes, were referred to as nuns. During meetings, members supposedly wore ritual white clothing, while the abbot wore red. Rumours of black masses and Satan or demon worship have subsequently also been attached to the club. Much of what we know, however, about the club, and it cannot be stressed enough, is based on largely dubious testimony, much of which is from members who were not permitted to join the higher levels of the club's activities, or their membership of the club had been revoked. <laughs> Good night and thanks for all the fish. Activities in the caves went on for 15 years, until 1766, by which time the caves had become empty. Many of those involved had either distanced themselves from the venue due to the ever-present scandal surrounding it, become bored with its novelty, or had simply died, most likely with smiles on their faces. This didn't mean that Hellfire was done for, though. The stories, the rumours, the ideas of what the club represented lived on. Even as recently as December 2021, a club in Sydney, Australia, was calling itself Hellfire. It has since, however, closed, as all have done before it, but as surely as Fishers for Fridays, a new Hellfire club is being plotted by someone somewhere in the world right now. And thanks to Stranger Things, 
the name will surely now take on a whole new meaning. 